that, that, uh, that's what we were discussing that we can have a kind of a virtual panel discussion where we all have our experts uh, on the on the group and uh, they come with uh, decades and decades of expertise uh, in this field. So uh, just to give a short overview of what we did in the webinar series, in the first series we just gave an overview of what is Indian accident scenario look like and 150,000 fatalities, close to 450,000 accidents. And nearly 450 people never come back home at the end of the day when you just divide the 150,000 divided by uh, uh, 24 hours multiplied by 360 days. So this was this is the very uh, important aspect of what what we we identified. And uh, we we also gave an insight of how exactly the Ministry of Road Transport report looked like and also uh, how exactly uh, the NCRB data looked like and uh, a little bit on how exactly. Uh, the part of uh, the Motor Vehicle Amendment Act, which came in, and things like that. And uh, the uh, the participants who were joined in, uh, we had an extreme uh, 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 good uh, uh, variable of all the participants coming from various fields, uh, starting from the ministry and also from the police department, and I also see all India transport team and also students and also with uh, many people from the uh, from the academic background as well. Uh, so this this is really good. Uh, so what we will do is we will just uh, go. Uh, so the the audience currently today is already having a base of what exactly uh, Indian accident scenario look like. And the last week, Mr. Pius Tiwari gave us a very good overview on uh, uh, how exactly um, uh, uh, the Good Samaritan Law is about, and we got plenty of questions, but time was not sufficient for us to answer uh, all the questions. But anyway, most of the questions we took. So uh, I think uh, Amar already gave a very good introduction about uh, uh, Mr. Adish and Deepan Tiwari. So I think uh, these two personalities does not require any big uh, kind of an interaction because they're known in the field of uh, road safety and they're doing their best jobs in their respective verticals. Uh, so what we will do is um, uh, we will just uh, start off with a small uh, uh, kind of eight to ten minutes uh, kind of um, info sharing from each of the expertise. We'll start with uh, uh, and followed by we can uh, Rajesh, uh, Dr. Rajesh can share how exactly his organization uh, and his contribution towards road safety and what, is, what is the problems that he is looking at and also what are the uh, suggestions that you can uh, target. So can we just have a quick slide, uh, like idea of like what are the key problems that we face today and uh, how your organization and as a person that you are trying to address these uh, through, through various uh, uh, collaborations, cooperations, projects, academics, whatever it could be. Just, just feel free to share this. Followed by which we will have around 15 20 minutes once people join in uh, a kind of a panel discussion with, uh, with, with the sharing. And then we will take up the questions from the audience and we'll have sufficient around 20 30 minutes of uh, question and questions because that's where we want to go from the floor and get all the people on. So this is the whole idea. So if the speakers are clear, I think uh, I will hand over my uh, stage to Professor uh, Thank you. So what is it? Do you want me to start? Yes, yes, ma'am. You can just start okay. and give an overview. Okay. I think okay. that time yes. is not sufficient for you to <laughs> cover the three. No, no, that's fine. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> Just one minute. So, um, actually, when I discussed with Dipanchu, it was uh, suggested that this is a panel discussion. So, therefore, I'm not going to have any slides for what I'm going to talk about. I will just raise some important issues. Okay. Topic that I thought, uh, and in fact, Dipanchu and uh, Amar suggested also. Uh, was to discuss uh, what is systems approach to traffic safety. Okay. So uh, this is very interesting because uh, this kind of takes us back to a little bit of of traffic safety. Uh, you uh, the numbers, you know, just when the first car came on the roads, which was like one or nineteen or two, right after two years, we started having traffic crashes, and. Uh, so, um, so we have, one of the countries from which we have really good data is U.S. And uh, if you look at U.S. numbers, almost up to 1939, 
the numbers were the graph kept um, increasing number of people dying in road traffic crashes it was so high there was lot of concern from all stakeholders involved from policy makers from people who were regulating traffic people who were manufacturing cars everybody was concerned and there was a committee formed in 1939 and the committee came up with lot of um, uh, suggestions on how to control uh, road traffic crashes and three important suggestions that this first committee on road safety came out with was that uh, we must have very good training of drivers uh, we must uh, teach very good uh, you know um, road users how to behave on the road and there should be very strict penalties on people who violate the traffic laws and uh, the, so these three and of course there were other recommendations but these three were three main recommendations and this kind of recommendation continued almost up to 1960 and it is a graph except during brief period when the world war 2 was going on the number of deaths did not reduce in all western countries including us and it kept on increasing almost up to 19 early 1960 and by mid 1950s many researchers and public health officials doctors pediatricians had started realizing that what we are do, trying to do to control traffic safety is not working obviously and it was uh, some pioneering work which was done in europe as well as us between late 50s and early 60s that the term systems approach was not coined however a lot of scientific studies were done at this time in order to understand how do people behave on the road road user behavior was actually scientifically uh, studied and in mid 1960s us was one of the first countries to have a institution national highway traffic safety board was uh, instituted in mid 60s in us professor bill hadden who was in fact a public health official a pediatrician he was he became administrator and he came up with the famous what is now called hadden matrix which is kind of you can say the base of systems approach at that it started at that time and we have continued to use that so what was that systems approach or hadden's matrix it was basically saying that instead of only focusing on who made the mistake on the road let us look at all different systems which are involved in the process of moving on the road and see where the systemic failure is happening and what are the main three main sub systems it is basically human beings who are using so it could be road user or the driver it is the way roads are designed and it is the way vehicles are designed so it's vehicle infrastructure and uh, the road user itself and then another very important thing that hadn't introduced and which has been refined further uh, from 60s to up to now is the principle that we cannot have a myopic view of trying to understand and solve safety problem myopic view means you are looking at exactly the moment this incident happened mm-hmm. you have to look at what could have been done before this incident happened what we can do during at the time of crash and sometimes even then the crashes are inevitable so what can be done later on so to take a very simple example if there is a crash between a pedestrian and a uh, car so we can look at can we, uh, what could be done to human beings to road infrastructure infrastructure and to the vehicle design which could first prevent reduce the probability of the crash all uh, crashes cannot be avoided so reduce the severity of crash at the time of if the crash happens and post after a crash has happened then what could be done in all three aspects which makes it easier uh, for us to provide proper aid to the victim so this was the hadden matrix and i would say this was kind of a basis for systems approach so many things happened all this time and by 1970s we started seeing graphs uh, number of deaths coming down really low 
uh, started uh, decreasing in most Western countries, including US. But by 80s, it was a plateau. It was not reducing any further. So then researchers went back and a lot of questions were asked, can we do something differently? What's going on? And this is when formally we coined the term systems approach, which is late 80s and early 90s. It uh, came from many disciplines, but uh, Sweden was one of the first countries to use it. And of course, the Netherlands, Britain, many countries where we have got very good safety records have started using it. And uh, so here we started very carefully looking at, let us look at what systemic faults can be reduced. So now we, two things we started focusing on, don't focus on human error, focus on what the systemic faults are. And uh, systemic fault means the three subsystems we are talking about, where the failure could occur. And as designer of the system, designer of vehicles, designer of roads, uh, designer of policies, what we can, how we can design these different aspects to, uh, first of all, reduce the probability of crash, but we know all crashes are, some crashes will still happen. So therefore reduce this, uh, what can be done to reduce the severity of crash? So this started becoming the focus and that is when we started having further success in mostly Nordic countries and in many Western European countries. Unfortunately, uh, this success we have still not experienced in most Asian countries, barring out Japan. So India is very much part of that. And unfortunately, you said that the numbers um, and the trend of traffic crashes have already been discussed in this webinar series. So I'm sure the participants are aware that today we have, according to official numbers, more than 150,000 people dying on road traffic crashes in India. And the absolute number continues to increase. Whereas many countries today, from the last 10 years, have, in Western countries have been talking about achieving zero deaths on the road sometime in future. And how do you achieve zero roads? By following these three main principles. The three main principles, which is also the cornerstone of, I would say, systems approach is number one. It is, uh, we must accept human ability. The way human beings are designed, we cannot have, we cannot tolerate energy impacts beyond certain uh, limit. So human bodies have a limit of uh, withstanding impacts of certain energy intensity. Second, acceptance of human error. Even after very good training and after knowing all the right things that you should be doing on the road, people can still make mistakes. So the systems have to be designed to absorb that mistake. For making that mistake, people should not die on in road traffic crashes. There can be severe injuries but now the target is to at least reduce fatalities. And uh, third, which is really important for all kinds of engineers, road engineers, as well as vehicle engineers, is to create a forgiving environment. If human beings, road users are going to make mistakes, so how can we design the roads? How can, how can we design the vehicles that for that mistake, people should not die on the road? So these three are the main uh, important principles of systems approach. And uh, all three subsystems that I uh, discussed and mentioned earlier, they all have to follow these basic three principles to achieve some time in future zero deaths. And uh, one of the very important thing that has been understood is that as we know, uh, energy transfer or impact is all about speed. The higher speed, the more energy in the system. So if we can control speed, that is going to give us huge benefits. But uh, many things can be done to control speed. But one of the most uh, effective way of controlling speed is by design. So how can we design the environment, the infrastructure, the roads in such a way that we can do appropriate speed? I think the term appropriate is very, very important because uh, depending on the context on the environment, the speed is going to be different. 
the speed at which we drive on highways where we expect very few pedestrians as compared to speeds that we should be driving in urban environment which is full of pedestrians and children is very different so this is the basis of actually um, suggesting speed limits and um, adhering to that so in urban environments maximum speed so far has been 50 kilometers per hour but now many countries are talking about lowering the speed in urban environment and uh, highways are designed differently because they are meant for little higher speed so i think these are the main um, concepts that i would uh, like to introduce at this moment and um, let's see let me take the questions after this thank you thank you thank you professor geeta that was really uh, you i think there's no need to give a, a basic understanding of the haram matter which you covered excellently and also gave three main principles so what exactly is happened i will i have a couple of questions exactly on three points i will come at later after dr rajesh uh, give us a brief of uh, how niti aayog is uh, working towards uh, road safety because we have been part of the move summit in uh, 2019 and there's a lot of activities which was done by our uh, uh 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 i think the director like amitabh sensor ji and also uh, many conferences were held and there are a lot of efforts which has been put in this year so if you can if you can just put us a, a quick glimpse of how exactly uh, the dio is working towards uh, uh this uh, this city uh, probably after that we'll just get into the panel discussion so dr rajesh uh, please yeah. yeah thank you thank you so much uh, mr girish uh, first of all i would love to compliment the organizers of the event for having this particular focusing on multi stakeholder action and road safety in a time when we are all in lockdown situation perhaps when we are experiencing less uh, instances of uh, road crashes now but that's not the case we are experiencing some level of uh, uh, incidences so this calls for a, a, a patient and a cool approach to the whole issue Sorry. Am I audible? Yes, quite. Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Quite. Yeah, yeah. Thank so, you. So, just hold on. So, apart from speakers, uh, so just hold on. Apart from speakers, can everyone uh, switch off their uh, videos and uh, mute their phone because it might uh, eat up the bandwidth and there might be delay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Doctor Rajesh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, as we know, like our country has been growing, and we are aiming like very. by to lean economy of course we have this challenge in between but we will be doing all our efforts to reach that's our ambition and uh, action and we have been also experiencing unprecedented urbanization if you recollect uh, the way we have grown in terms of uh, vehicle density and uh, transportation need we can appreciate that we had only less just around uh, 5 million motor vehicles in 80s if you take 80 as a benchmark and since that time our transportation demand has grown by eight times and road density hasn't grown to that extent this puts lots of constraints as uh, professor uh, kitam tiwari explained to us how the engineering aspects could have influence the overall security scenario or safety scenario of uh, road users similarly we also have to look at now the emerging context in the context of urbanization where several things happening to this calls for a sort of a multi stakeholder action yeah. so that is the beginning of uh, all policy interventions perhaps and uh, this begins from like we can say from global level to and it ends at local level let's see what is happening at uh, global level at global level we have already fixed our sdgs we have an ambition of uh, halving the instances incidences by 50% by 2020 this year and we also kept an ambition for the end of the next decade that is 2030 where we'll realize safer affordable and um, you know sustainable transportation scenario so this is a big area where niti aayog has already worked in our policies if you see the uh, strategy document 75 you will see that these principles are enshrined particularly sdg 1.2 in the context of urban mobility as uh, dr mr girish already mentioned move was done and after move many instant many interventions have happened in improving urban mobility 
and the core of those philosophies have been around uh, safe or affordable, accurate, uh, mm -hmm. uh, efficient, and sustainable transport. Now, if uh, when we talk about multi-stakeholder action, the the interventions doesn't uh, interventions rather don't uh, limit at national level. They have to go down to state level, to district level, even to local government level. That's it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the track. That's the vertical uh, integration that we need. We need integration also at policy level. And what is uh, is a sort of very comprehensive policy which is uh, laid out by the uh, transport ministry. So if you see our uh, transport the policy available, it clearly establishes the, uh, the the core of uh, national road safety paradigm. That paradigm has three concepts, as. Uh, uh, professor explained in the last uh, speech it it has a triangulation between roads motor vehicles and the human factor and this is a holistic approach and this is an approach in which the policy has been built up so from that perspective if i pull out some of the interventions which uh, we have done in the health division i can cite the instances of a comprehensive study we did to improve the trauma care in uh -huh. this country because uh, you know we are losing nearly around uh, maybe like uh, three percentage of gdp every year because of the uh -huh. morbidities and the mortalities caused by the road traffic crashes uh -huh. and what is relevant here is this loss can be minimized if you attend the issues or the crash scenes in the golden hour so attending the crashes in the golden hour is one one issue rather the first instance rather what would be the next instance next instance is getting the patient a specialized care as soon as the patient arrives in the hospital or the institution and i heard that uh, in the last webinar there was a discussion on good samaritan mm -hmm. so good samaritan's roles begins from the first uh, crash scene and then the good samaritan takes the patient to the institution and from there, the patient should get a sort of a, a specialized care. So here we had a lot of challenges. We have around uh, 500 to 600 trauma care centers in the country. Out of that, um, uh, 300 plus have been uh, set up directly with the funding and technical assistance of uh, the central government and rest have been by the state government. So, but however, we needed an efficient uh, uh, Governments, uh, governments and management of these trauma cares to to improve their services to address this challenge after losing the 3.3 percentage of GDP in terms of the rather uh, we should say that empirical loss of 3 percentage of GDP due to the crashes. So where what we have done is we did a comprehensive study of um, 100 plus uh, emergency care units in the country, and they have been now very constantly monitored. Uh, for improving their uh, service delivery. So this study is currently undergoing and maybe soon we'll get the inputs from uh, this study. What is relevant to the discussion is that this study and, uh, has covered both public and private sector in, in the private hospitals. It means rather tertiary care home centers. So the inputs we get can be just like uh, harmonized for both the sides, public and private sector, so that we can achieve a sort of uh, uh, easily implementable, much effective, inclusive uh, policy prescription for improving trauma care in the country. Okay. Secondly, uh, is with the state governments uh, in our pilot study of trauma care. So as a member of that team, I could also visit the trauma cares in the century in the country, particularly the centers in Pune, in Cochin, in Tivandapuram. And what I wanted to share with all of you is that what is to be appreciated is the need for local action, local action at district level, maybe at uh, uh, self, local self-government level, where we can aim for uh, zero vision plans. These zero vision plans can address the issues of uh, black spots in that district, if at all any there, can address the issues of uh, sensitive areas, sensitive pockets in that area, can also address issues of uh, data required for uh, monitoring these uh, cases. 
So once we develop that capability at district level with the involvement of different stakeholders, maybe it's uh, engineering institutions or uh, government state departments or uh, civil society partners. So once we have improved our, improved our institutional capacity to respond to the situation at the district level, definitely there is going to be a change. So the case I want to share is that, share with all of you is that the one which the uh, Kerala government did after our uh, decision. So what they planned was to have a pan Kerala uh, sort of uh, campaign for improving road safety concerns uh, with the involvement of local supplements. So that was the decision the principal secretary then taken. So as a matter of uh, capacity building, this program took off and uh, have been quite successful in connecting the local self-government to the concerns of road safety. So ultimately, I would say that setting on missions which will promote uh, discourses on road safety at local level, activating uh, district level road safety uh, authorities and uh, district level committees, and a, a great level of inclusive action with the help of NGOs, school children, the college students, NSS, NCC, the police, the medical fraternity. That will, that will help the district to definitely uh, to solve the challenges, then find out options for uh, addressing them, as well as resources also. I'm told that uh, in this, in today's meeting, we got uh, presentations from uh, public sector and enterprises also. So CSR is a good area for intervention because if, a, if you can adopt one district and uh, shape its a zero vision plan for a uh, road safety, that will be fantastic. That could be very well funded and monitored also at district level. So okay. this one suggestion. Secondly, we have to look at improvement of uh, governance of uh, road safety concerns. When we talk about multi-stakeholder action, it itself is a huge phrase and it simply says about the presence of different agencies. So that calls for a lot of uh, coordinated action. So this coordinated action, unless it is properly institutionalized and energized and monitored on evidence base, it is going, not going to be realized that effectively. So we should have, we should first have to build capacity to improve the more coordination and monitoring arrangements, improve data collection capabilities, and push for governance reforms uh, in this sector. The governance reforms, particularly in the context of um, quality of governance, uh, as uh, Dr. Gidam Tiwari mentioned, like in their prescriptions, one of the uh, rather few of the prescriptions have been related to enforcement. Of course, enforcement is one part of it, but governance involves not only enforcement, it involves a sort of a, a high quality into the action based on the needs of that particular district to address the issues and uh, challenges of road safety in that district. So that is the main point I wanted to share and rather request all of you to focus because if you can have a comprehensive uh, zero vision plan for each district, that would be fantastic because maybe by the turn of the decade, that is 2030, if we can achieve what we aim to the SDGs, that will be a fantastic contribution and a model uh, for other countries to also uh, learn and uh, experience from India's experience. With these words, I wish uh, the uh, webinar participants a great time ahead. And uh, I hope that um, you'll think about it and you'll go back to your own areas and find out every option to collaborate with the district authorities and uh, local governments, as well as the state and district transport authorities to push this agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. It was wonderful coverage of uh, all the activities, uh, what, what uh, Niti Aayog has done, uh, followed by uh, your suggestions of uh, taking the national uh, plan uh, to the district level. That was really good. and. Uh, also, uh, I like one statement, uh, taking from global to local. This is what we are lacking. We speak big things on the global yeah. platform, but when we come to the implementation part, we really fail because we do not have uh, efficient uh, uh, understanding of what is there in the ground. 
So uh, it's, it's a yeah. very well understood problem uh, from your side, and also uh, there, there is a requirement of an architectural uh, um, approach for it. So we will we will get into the discussion a little bit uh, in detail. Uh, yeah, before true. that, is Deepak is Deepak joined uh, uh, the call uh, organizers? No, sir, not yet. Okay, no, okay. Then, then, then uh, uh, we will just uh, go ahead with the discussion. Then, uh, because uh, Deepak is going to come in, so, uh, he represents the media platform. It's also another essential pillar for safety. So, possibly we will just plug in as soon as he joins. Uh, so, that's really great. So, uh, now, uh, uh, Professor Deepak is there. Hello. Ah, so, uh, we will just quickly start the discussion a little bit on. How exactly uh, uh, the uh, the multi-sectoral approach is really required for India? So, uh, if you have a close look on the event decade of action and the global plan, uh, which is which is generally discussed across the global, and also with the Brasilia Declaration, followed by Moscow Declaration, followed by Swedish Stockholm Declaration. So, they have divided the whole flat, uh, uh, road safety problem uh, as a global problem. And since 1.4-1.5 billion people are battled every year. Uh, across the globe, and India contributes close to 11% of the fatalities, which is the highest contributor in the world, and which is really an alarming trend for us. So, in view of this particular scenario, uh, the the global decade of action has given us uh, five pillars to work with. So, that exactly what uh, uh, Professor Gita has already touched uh, three pillars on it, like infrastructure, uh, education awareness, uh, and also on the vehicle safety aspects, and also on uh, on the post crash management system, and also the data management systems. So um, uh, Rajesh uh, also uh, clearly covered about how a um, golden hour uh, works. Uh, so in this case, I would like to uh, just uh, ask a couple of things uh, and the views uh, from Professor uh, that um, uh, you, you clearly said that the human error uh, is, is another important part and we have to accept and absorb it. So if you closely look at Ministry of Road Transport report and if you detail uh, uh, study about it and the root cause of accidents, which is, which is clearly given as 38 percent, is the human error. Yeah, and there is no other system, there is no other cause which is uh, uh, given. When you get into the drill down data of how exactly this is split, no human is willfully going to make an accident. Right. So in this case, uh, how do you access the system? So in, there is 78 percent of accidents. Uh, which is mainly because of the human error, which is spread by the rest of the transport. I would see in two ways. One, either the data is wrong, or I would say that uh, we should just accept the human error. What makes the human to make this error, and how can we accept 78 percent of the cost and correct the whole system to get this error? You are using it. Okay, so uh, the report uh, that you're mentioning, Ministry of Roads and Highways or um, individual cities, wherever traffic police is putting together reports, they are always writing. Um, MORTH now says 78%, but at one time they were also saying 90%. And uh, if you look at earlier traffic reports tr prepared by traffic police, they always said, you know, uh, most for most of the crashes, the traffic police writes, the crash is because of rash and negligent driving. So it is always the driver's fault. So we have to understand it in a very different way. When police is um, uh, preparing these reports, first information reports, or reporting the uh, details of the crash, it is, it is from the legal perspective. They have to book each case under certain Indian penal code. They are not doing crash analysis. Simply that I, the case has to be registered against a person and therefore they must find either they say the victim who was, uh, who was at fault or the driver which was at fault. And in general, the principle the police is using is that the driver of the bigger vehicle is always at fault. And because if you see it from legal perspective, it is basically saying that, you know, vulnerable people, we are not saying that they are at fault. So, one aspect. Now, when we are designing road safety strategies, we are looking at different ways of how to reduce this number of deaths and morbidity uh, on our roads. This has nothing to, this, uh, or I should say, this has very little to do with the police report. Okay. Because as I mentioned earlier, 
there now the understood uh, principle amongst researchers and policy makers from the countries which have been successful in reducing number of crashes that we do not depend on people always to do the right things right. then how do we re reduce crash knowing that some people will make a mistake design the road differently knowing that some people will make a mistake design the vehicle differently so let me give you some specific example otherwise it sounds it probably sounds very incorrect that you know we are encouraging people to do the wrong things quote and quote so for example that uh, you know today when vehicles are being designed and this started happening in 1970s onwards there are standards how the vehicle is designed how we are designing the seat belt how we are designing the airbag is knowing that in case of crash how do you prevent the severity of injury mm -hmm. the way vehicles are designed that the impact is taken by the vehicle and the energy transfer to the uh, driver is much less mm -hmm. and we are looking at pedestrian impact standards now we are then we are you know that then the vehicles exterior is being designed differently so that the damage to the pedestrian is much less right so this is what means so it has nothing to do with whether pedestrian was at fault or whether driver was at fault it's a different matter altogether so police report cannot be the basis for this kind of analysis police report okay. is excellent to understand the epidemiology who are the victims in which environment it's happening urban non urban arterial roads non arterial roads near junction away from junction and what time so you have to be very careful in using so police has lot of useful information but when a, one has to understand which is subjective and uh, objective and correct information right. that we can reliable right. information that we can use okay. so according police, to you percent of it it's human error and therefore if you believe that then all your strategies are going to be have better training schools right. and we have known since 1939 that those strategies have not worked we have to do things differently it is right. not thing that do not have driver training school of course you need driver training school but we cannot depend on that to become the system safer you need trained drivers to be on the roads but to reduce number of crashes many other important things have to be done okay this is how has to understand uh, you know how the data is being collected and how the data is being used yes thank you because we do not have any other databases uh, or or the data sheets which we can tell about the numbers of fatalities injuries and also the total number of accidents the only thing what we rely on is the report what is been uh, submitted by the mos and i clearly understand your perspective yeah just let me call it number or so that's what i said the report has lot of useful information and not a lot of not so useful information right <laughs> so one has to make a clear understanding the useful part is excellent so we are saying that yes number of deaths this is one of the most reliable sources we say yes and who are the victims you have to read the reports and then find out who are the victims that is recorded correctly not reported correctly in the tables but recording is right. so there right. are lot of these nuances that one has to follow right right So, so with my expertise in the in-depth data collection systems, and I also know there are two registers which is followed. One is the DIR, one is FIR. So, whatever data goes to FIR is the report what we see in the board. Whatever is under-reported, which all goes into DIR, which is which stays in the district level uh, publication. So, according to this, uh, do you think uh, the data is really important in order to uh, do a in-depth study for India? Because we really need to understand the causes, and this has to be somewhere. out like the national automobile safety system like us or outs like uk or gdas like germany kind of some kind of a database has to be there which has to be enabled from the private system, from the government system so i'm sorry so so this do you think that this kind of data system has to be developed or is already there or has to be evolved uh, if not what is the intervention that the government has to do in order to get such kind of an uh, at least uh, near accurate data in order to do a scientific analysis so you are absolutely right you mentioned all these international systems uh, and this is the problem which has been recognized everywhere that uh, police has the legal authority it is one of the best data sources 
However, it has its own limitations because it is being done from legal perspective. So, uh, to uh, you mentioned a lot of other international sources, but you know that uh, one of the best uh, data systems which was instituted uh, is FARS, Fatal Accident Recording FARS, System yeah. in the US. Yeah. Yeah. And it has a very similar background to what we are going through. In the mid 70s, they were also going through exactly the same thing. From police data, you know, we are having all these difficulties in understanding the details. And based on that, we cannot have a very good scientific understanding and design our strategies. Whether it is for vehicle standards or whether it is for road standards, that's not good enough. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if you know, I'm sure you know about FARS, that uh, it is a central federal government institution. They are helping each state, they are funding each state uh, by providing them expertise. And uh, for people, the states which are part of this, actually now all US states are part of this, uh, they share the data. The, right. uh, so they don't depend on police anymore. Police data is further processed by experts. And experts look at it, they fill up all the gaps, they remove all the unreliable part of it, and uh, they blank out the uh, personal identities because that is not important for any research purposes or policy making purposes. And it's publicly available. Right. Today I can log to FARS website and I have all the details available for uh, US, uh, crashes happening in US. And based on that, I can do a lot of research, come out with a lot of good understanding. This part is not possible in India at all right now. Okay. So one of the most important thing today the government can do is to have a system like this. And remember that, you know, accidents are, I mean, there are so many accidents, so you cannot have in-depth uh, analysis of each and every accident. So that statistics come into uh, handy. You can have good statistical sampling based on that. But of right. course, first create a database which is cleaned up, is available to researchers, it is available to policy makers. Mm -hmm. And we have to base our policies on that kind of database and further analysis on it. Not the simple police reports which are available today. Perfect, thank you. Uh, that, that, that's a very, very, very good uh, uh, overview of uh, how exactly we have to build such a system for India to understand the root cause. So, Dr. Rajesh, you are you are in the right chair as of now with Niti Aayog. So, uh, how how exactly Niti Aayog? Uh, because you are the supreme power as of now to establish something on the platform. So, uh, what uh, we are all uh, were discussing is there is no accurate data systems in India. First of all, to understand what is the root cause. Yeah, I cannot bring in a system as, as Professor was telling that let's accept the human error and also forget the error and design and redesign the system. Uh, uh, they, which accommodate all these things specifically, uh, for example, take the human error and also have an intervention with respect to emissions and the environment to, to, to reduce the fatalities or accidents. Yeah? In this case, to design this, what is basically required is to understanding of the root cause of accidents. That is really missing. Really, yeah? Because uh, what we do is we read the uh, uh, data from PARS uh, or NAS or OCIS or from GDAS. And try to bring in the system, same thing to India, which does not fit because Indian drivers are totally different. And they have different patterns of driving style, different psychologies, and there are so many things which are different. So, uh, do you think from Niti Aayog side, is there any thought process to establish such a system to really understand the root cause? May not be the whole India, maybe one, one unit in a district or a state, where we get a much deeper analysis on the inside of data, uh, not too much involved with respect to legality. Yeah? Uh, do you have any thought process or any ideas that government would yeah. like to do in the future? Yes, first of all, uh, yes, we all share the concern of uh, quality of data data validation requirements, uh, availability and access of data, all these are major concerns in uh, arriving at quality evidence-based decisions. So the first uh, happy news is that uh, you must have read already uh, that Niti Aayog is coming up with the national data infrastructure. So once uh, this process has already started uh, in its formalities, so once we realize it, then we will have a, a platform to definitely aggregate quality data and avail making available data for the stakeholders and consumers for uh, their analytical requirements. So that's the happy news with us. But 
uh, when it comes to road crashes, of course, uh, we I also share the concerns expressed by uh, Professor Hiram Tiwari about the quality of investigation. So we just report the cases. Rather, beyond that, I think we don't analyze it. So that's not the end of the situation, perhaps. The, rather, we see the all chain begins from there, in fact. We need to bring in quality for investigation. Investigation on two counts, on legal aspects and also on the non-legal aspects, which is all about the the, the, arc, the umbrella theme which we are talking about, the multi-stakeholder action, where in the network of things the issue got failed so and where we can improve. So this sort of a quality investigation we need to bring up. And secondly, it's also about data collection. Now, data are spread, as we just heard. We have data collected, maybe quality a question or a, its validation a question, but still we have data, but they are located in different quarters. Maybe data available with the transport department, data maybe available with the police department, maybe with the, the state uh, uh, road safety authority. So that is a healthy scenario. So scenario is helped only when we have a common data sharing point. In the context of a road crashes, maybe we can consider the state road uh, safety authority database as a sort of one which can help to solve us this problem. Otherwise, yes, we need to address this uh, data collection issue also. And uh, the next point is all about uh, the transmission, which I have partially test in my previous uh, state. Like, uh, of course, we can collect uh, like data or platforms, but that hardly gets shared or transmitted. So we should also think for a, a, streamless, a seamless uh, transmission of available data, or maybe that mm -hmm. is realized through the data infrastructure. And next and most almost most important thing is the analysis. So we need a, a sort of a capable analysis of the data to arrive at you know quality conclusions, which is all missing. So maybe like uh, we need to focus on capacity building for our institutions in the district or state. So once we have the required capacity building, perhaps we will be able to address all these concerns. This is what I like to share at this moment. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rajesh. Actually, uh, to, to add to your point, uh, so you said that there is a national data infrastructure plan which has been developed in India uh, under the NITI Yoga, which is really a good thing. So uh, I would also bring you to the notice that in India, we already have a lot of NGOs and also private and the corporate people already doing data connection. For example, if you consider uh, uh, all the OEMs and consortium people uh, are doing a data connection in the different states, for example, in Mumbai Phone Express Highway, Delhi, and also in Lucknow, Jaipur. This all comes under a unit called RATI, it's called Role Access Sample System, probably you might be aware of it. There is another NGO which collects data specifically. Uh, in, uh, for example, in Delhi area, uh, IRTE, which is done by Dr. Puroi Panita, and also TRIP from IIT Delhi also did a lot of work on, on expertise of data collection and the root causes. And uh, uh, we also have Save My Field of Foundation from the uh, team is also doing this. So you already have this expertise. They are already doing their business people. Uh, uh, so the larger aspect of what I would recommend or also suggest to do is that how do you integrate the existing uh, uh, know-how and the competency to make your national data infrastructure plan and it much more faster uh, to bring it onto the platform. So this is one part process which I would like to leave it to you. And if you have any comments, it's okay, or you just take this point along with you, we can have another discussion specific to how to build this. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, if you look at the, uh, the concept plan, which must be there uh, on the website, uh, you'll, you'll understand that it's a sort of inclusive approach which is being followed. So uh -huh. we need to, uh, it's initiated uh, like uh, the basic formalities are getting over maybe by this time. So maybe we have to wait for some more time to really see okay. this concrete issue. Okay. So, so, um, so we, we are already there. So we have expertise and competency. So we will be uh, joining hands to you uh, together to, to build this uh, mission effect. I think uh, the main idea is to aggregate data, quality data, and share with uh, the users of the data for right. uh, for efficient right. Right. and right. Uh, quality decision making, or for product right. development or mm -hmm. for economic uh, enterprise. May I ask a question here? 
Hello. Uh, yes, yes. ma'am. Come yeah. on, come on. Yes, so basically I wanted to ask the, uh, Dr. Rajesh Kumar also. Um, you know, in New Motor Vehicles Act, there is a point, there is a discussion on instituting road safety agency. And uh, basically, earlier version of the bill was about this, not exactly uh, establishing a national highway traffic safety administration. It's something parallel uh, with its own budget and some powers because one of the things is that uh, as uh, Mr. Gideon Kumar also mentioned that there are a lot of private agencies and individual institutions collecting this is not enough at a national level unless it's a national database like FARS or like NAS uh, it is not publicly available. See RASI is collecting a lot of data but it's not for public uh, 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 consumption. So the difference there is that if you make the data available to more researchers and more uh, freely available, more people use it yeah. and in the end we end up having much better insights. And if there are any yeah, problems sure. in collection of data, that is brought out and there is a method of correcting it. So it's not you know pointing fingers that you are not doing right or something. But unless we yeah. use it more, we can't correct it all. Yes. Right. So exactly. That is the whole thing. So my question is really, has there been any discussion on establishing this road safety agency? And one of the aspects that the road safety agency was supposed to do was have this uh, kind of data collection system at the national level. Working very closely. Okay. Yeah. So Professor, the first Professor, question, Professor, we can't see that, you. Uh, Please switch on your video because you are also the panelist. People are messaging me. We are not seeing the problem. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. <laughs> So on the first question, I would say that uh, uh, this can be answered very specifically only by the Ministry of uh, Roads, uh, Road Transport. But on the second question about the data, data architecture, uh, when we, uh, the discussions on uh, national data infrastructure uh, already accommodated the need for integrating whatever sort of uh, uh, sorts of databases available with us. So all databases will speak to each other under this architecture. And that, I think that takes care of the uh, concern expressed by the professor. So once, in whichever ministry, whatever databases are there, all will come get organized under the national data infrastructure, then it will be available for the, uh, the actors and stakeholders, maybe in the policy regime or in the scientific research regime or in the economic regime. So that, that, I think the concern, the concern is taken care of in the the conceptualization of the infrastructure. Okay, so uh, my, my next next topic uh, for the discussion is about uh, uh, to, to give, give an overview of again coming from global to local. So we, we just flashed in the year uh, 20, uh, 2010, yeah, 2010 in uh, Moscow and 2015 in Brasilia that we will get into a um, uh, kind of uh, 2020 by 15. Um, can someone mute the? I'm just getting distraction. Okay, so 2020 by 50. That means reducing fatalities by 50 percent by 2020. So this is this is a really a very challenging topic, and 80 percent of countries who accepted this could not achieve, and India did not even achieve one percent as well. So uh, despite of bringing motor vehicle amendment act, very high level high tech infrastructure. And also uh, very good post-trauma care centers with high-tech uh, ambulances, and also, uh, you know, for example, getting up uh, with uh, new vehicle safety technologies, uh, for instance, at an international standard phase. But still, we are not able to reduce even one person, uh, or rather, I would say that we are increasing at the pace of three to four percent every year in terms of fatalities alone. So, what could be the cause? Or where are, where are we making the basic assumptions wrong in order to get uh, this? At least uh, we should think about this again. The next uh, declaration in Stockholm happened uh, this February. Now, 50 by 2020 is gone because we could not even reduce one person. Now, it is 50 by 2030. 30 by 50. That's the change. And it's again in 2030, they'll say 40 by 50. Yeah? So, where are we going wrong according to your thought? 
Is the question to, to, to me? Yeah, yeah, both of you can put it back. Thank you. Mr. Kumar, do you want to go first? Maybe I, I would say that uh, maybe you can start. You can uh, start with, then I'll com uh, compliment that. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, one of the main thing is that um, uh, so we have a lot of learnings through history, and what the history shows that first we have to understand our situation and the principles, the scientific principles, very carefully. And unless we design strategies based on that, it's not going to work. So what is our situation? If we look at the details, more people die who are outside the car or vehicles today than inside. Internationally, cars have become safer for the passengers, for the drivers. But cars and vehicles are not safe when they are hitting pedestrians or motor, uh, motorized two-wheelers or bicyclists. So our context is slightly different. And this is our problem, and we have to work on this. Second very important thing, in most countries, highways have become very safe because highways have been designed crash barriers to accommodate driver error, to accommodate uh, vehicle uh, accidents. So what is different on our highways? When we look at the details, more than 50% of the collisions happen on our highways. Pedestrians are the victims. This is very different from what you have seen in the West. So when you go to North America or you go to Western Europe, the countries which have been successful in reducing crashes, more people are inside the vehicle than outside. Outside problem remains in urban area. In the urban area, whether it's New York or London or many other cities also, the so-called safe cities have still not solved problems for pedestrians. So two, three things very important. We have motor vehicle amendment bill, but again, a lot of emphasis as you know, has been done on penalties and on driver training. I was really hoping that we would have national institutions set up with start looking into the details, collecting scientific evidence, and then maybe in the next five years, we start seeing some reduction. This is not a one-time thing. But what we do know from is that who are the most vulnerable people? Pedestrians and motorized two-wheelers. Very much Asian problem. What can we do for motorized two-wheelers? Helmets. Our MBA has made helmets mandatory, but we just did study in eight northern states, uh, not northern, actually, eight states spread all over India, including Kerala and Karnataka. And we found that the compliance, the number of people wearing helmets, in urban area, sometimes as low as 20. So Delhi is the only city where we found that people have about 90 to 95% compliance of helmet wearing. Pillion riders, very few people are wearing, including Delhi. And as we know that motorized wheelers have no other protection. Right. And with helmet also, it's only 30% effectiveness. So why helmets are not being instituted, not being enforced, uh, I cannot understand this. Because this is clearly a question of priority and enforcement. Second important thing, speed control by design. So that is the first, you know, earlier also I had mentioned that because when we have weak institutional systems and uh, we do not have... Uh, we do not have uh, good compliance. We do not have good um, enforcement regimes. It's the design which is going to matter. So these are the two things which we haven't done seriously at all. So we really have to look at these two aspects. So to add on, before Rajesh can comment, to add on to the point what uh, Mr. Gitu was talking about. So helmet wearing rate in India is 13 percent. Uh, helmet rating rate in India is 13 percent for the rider. Uh, which we did a short study, a district study, and also pillion riders, only 2% of pillion riders were helmet. And specifically on seatbelt usage, we have less than 20% seatbelt usage on the driver side, and passenger side, we have less than 8%, and on the rear end side, we have less than 0.5% seatbelt usage. So we are not using the primary recent devices itself 
uh, to stay in our cell. And there was a big discussion in, in the last uh, summit in London also in the previous series, uh, how we can enforce helmet. So my question was, why do you need to enforce? If you want to save yourself, you have to wear it. That's it. There's no question that they have no answer. So this is one thing which was discussed. So I just added a couple of points. Uh, so, uh, Rajesh, you can just go ahead with your comment. Yeah, I think uh, this point is uh, taking us to the original point where from we started. So, we started from the all premises of multi-stakeholder action. So, yes, enforcement is a part of a multi-stakeholder action. But that's not the, uh, the complete, this all and all of it. So, I think this is the real reason why we should engage with the communities at the local level. Maybe the, the point I to mention before about uh, the zero vision plans for districts. If we can uh, really shape it out for very sensitive districts first and thereafter with other districts, maybe uh, we can really uh, move towards realizing multi-stakeholder action because multi-stakeholder action is easier said than actually realized. That realization comes with a concerted involvement and concerted involvement happens only when we have an adequate level of uh, information available about in the society about the risk and uh, risk mitigation measures and its economic and uh, inclusion options. So that needs to be realized. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we need to uh, give weight days for enforcement and uh, road safety related other parameters which uh, uh, Professor Kidan just uh, discussed with us. But at the macro level, I would say that if you analyze uh, the, the statistics, maybe the questions and the validity aspects of those types are uh, often sometimes questions, questions. Mm -hmm. But then otherwise, if you just analyze it, we can make two major observations. 40 to 50 percentage of our you know, fatality stashes are happening around the, the traffic points, like on the roads and the road traffic regulation points. This is one important observation. Second is around 70 to 80 percent of the uh, crashes involves a sort of a driver negligence with the point which we discussed. So we can't completely uh, comprehend that driver negligence is a sort of a, a re highly reasoned uh, statement of the point, uh, the reasons why it shouldn't be have already been discussed by Professor mm -hmm. Peter. But mm -hmm. apparently if you consider that, how we can address these two challenges. If you remove the, the risk associated around traffic points, at least 30 to 40 percent of the cases are addressed. So this is on priority area for action. How we can mitigate the risk around the traffic points. And second is the, this, the, the heavy load, which is about the, the overall category of uh, negligent driving. So this can cause for investments in quality training, quality vehicles, uh, call it, I mean, road safety related concerns addressed in driver training, in vehicle uh, designing, road designing, and road use, use uh, behavior of the road users, it's all that. So I think these are the three major areas perhaps we can immediately focus and achieve very high, uh, you know, positive gains in mitigating this risk. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, I think I will just wind up with a few concluding remarks with one question, and then we are getting loads and loads of questions from all the people who are on the webinar. So it will not be uh, good that if we, if we just have a monologue between us. So I will just uh, formulate the questions a little bit, uh, and then we can just answer uh, all the questions uh, in just a couple of minutes after the conclusion of our discussion. So um, as of now, uh, we, we had a very good discussion on various perspectives of the exact English problem here. And also from the government perspective, what you are doing, and also from the academics, and also from the deeper knowledge of what the real problem, how to attack with the scientific uh, mindset. So now my question is like, uh, it, was, it was very clearly put forward for, by professors about the head-on matrix, which has every accident has three different layers of human infrastructure, and uh, the education part or the awareness part of it. So now uh, my question is, can government implement the head-on matrix wherever it is possible? But to just have this as a part of non-legal data set for, uh, uh, for the usage of policy planning, for the usage of uh, 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 data analytics, or a few other things in going forward. Uh, this is the question, Rajesh, is this possible? 
or if it yes, uh, what could be the steps that can be taken? I'm sorry, uh, there was a transmission uh, issue. Could you repeat the last part of the question? Right. Uh, so, so the last part of the question is there was a serious understanding of hydro matrix. Um, hydro matrix. Yes. Yeah, hydro matrix yeah, is yes. about collecting data from infrastructure, human, and uh, education and awareness uh, loss, and then putting all together as the real cause for accident. Every accident we had these three sets or multiple sets in various columns. So is it possible for us to postulate this information at district level, at the local level? They were possible to collect this as a part of scientific evidence to collect this and then consolidate and publish the report for the public and then utilize it. Uh, if yes, uh, is government thinking about it? Or if not, like, you have plans to do it. Yeah, so. I think uh, the position of the government can be well explained only by the transport ministry. Uh, very uh, very precisely, but I would say that um, already provisions are available in the existing policy regime. So I mentioned about the district level arrangement. So uh, this this concerns if you are well integrated uh, or rather taken up before that authority, district authority or the committee. Many of the issues get uh, solved. For instance, uh, if you recollect the uh, in, uh, like uh, the interventions of AP government, how they managed to remove the dynamically shifting um, uh, black points in AP. Mm -hmm. So that is it's like a close monitoring at district level or even at the high sensitivity level areas will help to address the problem very like uh, to great extent. Mm -hmm. So again, I guess uh, we, should, we I would argue that rather that we should focus at the district level, engage with these uh, institutional pro arrangements provided by the policy and legal framework, and the uh, um, financial resources are also available. Maybe HR resources or non-HR resources they are also available. But, uh, yeah. yeah. So only thing like we need to really get engaged with them and develop uh, real practical plans for the district to. Uh, alleviate the or rather mitigate the risk of railing for in that particular district. So I would say okay. like that, but again, coming to the uh, policy position, I would say yes, you need to hear from the transport ministry really directly on it. Thank you, thank you, Ashish. You have a willingness to uh, accept our proposal and uh, going forward, you can put this proposal towards the ministry. And this will be a really important point uh, because we have to really think about a uh, couple of things. So for example, if you just uh, look at uh, certain large vehicle syndrome problems. I'm getting questions with respect to large vehicle syndrome problems. Uh, in India, like if, 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 as, as Professor clearly said, that uh, the vulnerable road users are the most prone to mortality, and they are the people who have been killed more than the people who are sitting inside the vehicle. So, if you just have a look on this, a motorcycle or a bicycle is a car, the fault is always under the car. And when a car hits the track, the fault is always under the track. Yeah, I don't know when the track hits an aeroplane, the fault will be an aeroplane, I guess. So, this is the kind of uh, recording what we are uh, doing. And uh, going from. Hello? Yeah, that's where I think uh, the, uh, the point of quality of investigation comes to play. Okay. So, so, no, yeah, but my point here is like uh, for in, in this scenario, we need an absolute requirement for us to think a little bit offshoot of the legal entity and also the legal recordings and also on the scientific recordings. And so in this case, I think uh, we had a very good discussion about uh, talking about all that. Like my last last and final point before we take the questions is uh, uh, like uh, uh, we, we we have multi sector because uh, OJT is not one sector. We need infrastructure side. Uh, we need, uh, uh, I think I'm getting too much of this. Can 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 all of us mute the mic? Uh, for instance, can we just mute the mic and restart again? Sorry for this. Okay, I think now it's better. Perfect. So uh, my, my question is like uh, any any accident prevention is really required either by uh, by all the multi sectoral people. For example, the post trauma care, uh, the the engineering, the road engineering, the infrastructure, and uh, also the vehicle manufacturers, the policy makers, the uh, the people who are on the road, the maintenance of the road. There are various sectors involved in this. So um, now that, that when all these multi sectors uh, are doing their own bit of their job. 
and all the sectors are, are very much focused in order to reduce fatalities and doing their own bits in their own vertical. Yeah. So what is missing is there is no collaborative effort. Uh, to give an instance, how this COVID-19, uh, the, the pandemic, has been attacked in the entire globe is because it is all happening in, in one location and everything is concentrated and people are battling, let say, out uh, of, of 400,000, 1,500 people are battling in India so far in the last three months and the government is making so much drastic measures for this. But every day, 400, 500, close to 500 people are, do not come to their home. And when you take around three months in time, it's roughly around 10,000 people are battling in road traffic accidents. So this pandemic is going to be an epidemic in road traffic. So uh, according to this, there needs to be a multi-sectoral approach. Yeah. So my final question uh, to both of you is that uh, uh, every industry, every corporate, every NGO, every educational institution, and also government agencies, they're doing their own bit in their own way, in their own fashion. Is there a way to integrate all these people on one umbrella and collectively work as one task force of understanding and bringing up the real change in the community of India to save any lives? Your final thoughts on this? I asked you or Dr. Rajesh. Yes, anybody can go ahead. I would, I would say that. Uh, Dr. Rajesh, you can just go ahead and then uh, mute your mic, then Dr. Geeta says. Yeah, okay. sure. So I would say that uh, we should be using the existing arrangement for uh, state level road safety authorities to converge and address the concerns because they have been provided by the law that structure is already created. So uh, when it comes to multi-stakeholder action, definitely it is a uh, integration between information database, uh, the concerns around uh, road infrastructure, and PWD and uh, constructing departments, vehicle manufacturers, of course, that point will come to national level uh, arrangement. And then a uh, safer driving, then also about um, HR resources for uh, investigation analysis, and uh, traffic safety education. So what the, these are all the major pillars of this arrangement. Of course, uh, the uh, emergency medical services also. But then most of these things are pillars are concerning to the state. So since we have a state level um, a road safety authority provided, so I, I feel that we should be strengthening it to realize most of it. And the rest of the things which are having a mandate at uh, regional or uh, National level, they should be addressed at the national level. Thank you. Okay. Uh, professor? Yes. <clears throat> Actually, my interaction with state level authorities uh, in the last three, four years hasn't been that optimistic, to put it very mildly. <laughs> and, uh, so, first thing we did, uh, we did some work for Supreme Court Committee on Traffic Safety. And uh, there we actually went and uh, audited what kind of state level authorities had been set up. Okay. And we found that, you know, states had all kinds of difficulties in actually setting up an independent authority. And most of them were headed by a person as an additional chunk. It was not one dedicated person looking at the road safety. So, to, just to give you in a nutshell, you know, that means basically we found that uh, the way road safety authorities had been set up right now are completely in. They, are, they do not have the expertise level of the kind of personnel which is required to deliver road safety short term, medium term and long term. That is not there at all. There are no dedicated budgets. There are all kinds of difficulties uh, with the states. Uh, that is happening now. So, and it continues to be, uh, you know, that uh, basically uh, district level meetings are happening and uh, your commissioner or district magistrate is chairing those meetings. Those meetings are based on without any data and it's mostly people saying that I think the problem is here and they start working on that. It's not systemic effort at all. So if this is going to continue, I think Mr. Giri was said earlier that in 2030, again, we will miss the target. We will not be able to use deaths by 50% as uh, what the target says. If we have to do it, we have to be very serious about scientific expertise which is required. And 
Exactly. This is not one time thing. This is basically, you know, it's people adapt to many changes. So you have to study continuously. For example, we earlier we uh, discussed this problem of uh, non-compliance helmet wearing. So it is puzzling. MBA says do it. Many states have actually already notified it. Then why do we not see it on the ground? That means there is something more to it, and we have to scientifically find out how to make it effective. And a voluntary, it doesn't work. There is enough evidence for that. Why in Delhi police is able to enforce it, and in the neighboring state police is not able to enforce it? We have to understand this carefully. So a lot of this kind of continuous work is required. Enforcement also has to have a lot of scientific inputs to it. Unless we start doing that and uh, targeted strategies, we are not going to have success. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deepak. So now, now let's take uh, a couple of questions uh, which has been uh, populated uh, all the way. And all the uh, viewers uh, kind of typing your questions. And I will try to accommodate all the questions, uh, whatever possible, uh, by clubbing uh, the similar questions together. And uh, if not possible, then probably we will answer all the same things at the later time. So one question which, uh, which just came in uh, right away was, uh, uh, yeah, there was also a question uh, which, which directly talks that, uh, oh, one second. Uh, okay, this is a professor uh, from CRRI. Uh, uh, his, his, his direct question is that, uh, the road crash fatality uh, data source is directly taken from police source and they are the controllers of the law and order to the primary aim. And uh, such data is collected by the police and uh, they only focus on offense, not on the uh, real cause. Considering about uh, pattern of the road crashes, a white paper was submitted to the government and he says that he has submitted a white paper to the government and uh, to identify the root cause of the accident. And uh, what is the present uh, uh, status of this white paper? And uh, can you kindly elaborate? Would you consider such kind of white paper to be submitted? Uh, for the person who has sent this question, possibly I am not really sure whom you are given this white paper. Uh, or at least we can say this, uh, uh, we can hear from Rajesh that how, how such kind of uh, public interest in terms of uh, research publication is taken into consideration in the public interest. Hello, yeah, I am Dr. Velmurugan. I just want to put up this question to Mr. Rajesh. This particular thing is given to the uh, this uh, National Bureau of uh, Research. Uh, like uh, for that, uh, we are just Highway Patrol Police is the order of the day. Like uh, that was one of the major suggestion which has been brought about. Uh, so there, we at CRRA have helped a particular uh, organization with it. So oh, highway proposal has not seen the light of the day now, and uh, that's ending this kind of situation and crashes. Sorry. So this is uh, this, uh, this question is more like a uh, policy issue. Like we need to take up with the ministry perhaps uh, to realize it. So maybe uh, the as a recommendation, IRSA can take up this issue with the ministry. Otherwise, uh, uh, the main database still followed is the NCRB that gives a reflection of uh, uh, loss of lives. But the uh, Transport Ministry also maintains a database. But apart from that, we have a specialized one. Perhaps this call we need to engage with the NHI. Yeah, at the end of the day, this data actually police. Uh, uh, Rajesh, uh, thank you very much, sir. We will, we will get back to your answer, uh, Mr. Ben Morgan. So we'll go to the next question. Uh, can you kindly mute your mic? Uh, we, we just have to get, get into a couple of other questions which has been asked. Uh, uh, so there's a question from uh, from uh, from a student who talks about uh, what about the increased stock over ratings for the vehicles which is not especially in the country uh, for cars and two-wheelers. Uh, so uh, the modern days uh, two-wheelers will have high speed and high stock uh, uh, in the sense that they have more speed. So according to you, what should be the uh, speed for the country and if Increasing uh, the PC of the vehicles uh, on the road is really good for India or not? I think Professor can address this. What should be the speed limit for India 
And as you say, the research is going good, and then you have a lot of vehicles which is coming up with high speed and high cost. So, how are we going to deal with this issue? Uh, un unmute me. Professor, unmute yeah, yeah, Sorry, sorry, yes. I yeah. unmuted myself, yes. So, uh, speed issue is not unique to India. Speed issue is unique to the context. So, uh, world over now, it is uh, recommended that urban speed limits have to be 50 or below. Why 50? Because there is a very strong empirical relationship has been found in different situations, which is applicable to India also, that if a person is hit at impact speed of 50 kilometers per hour, then the chances of dying are more than 80%. But the same person hit at 30 or less than 30, the chances of fatality is less than 8%. So this speed curve actually determines what should be the speed limit in different contexts. Since in urban areas, we cannot imagine an urban area without people on the road. Therefore, the speed limits have been fixed at 50. It has nothing to do with car technology, it has nothing to do with any other uh, human behavior. It is to do with frailty of human body, which I was mentioning earlier. And uh, in fact, near school zones where you have children, children are unpredictable and more vulnerable than adults, the speed limits have been brought down further. So the suggestion for uh, places near school is that by design, you have to ensure that the vehicles do not go above 30. And you know, in residential areas, they can even be lower. But on highway, we, have, we can go at higher speed because we do not expect people to be walking along the highway. But we do have this problem that our highways are passing through small towns and villages, and they are becoming like a local road. So this is something very specific to India, and we have to come up with design strategies here. So, uh, that, I, yeah. so basically, you know, my answer is that speed limit is context based. Context based, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, my question is like there is recently you can know that uh, BNV SAP is coming, the Bharat New Vehicle Assistance Program is coming for all the cars. So, the crash test has to be done for all the vehicles, for the cash workers of the vehicle to understand the uh, safety of the occupants sitting inside the car. So, there is a big debate going on in an international forum that 64 KPS at full frontal crash has to be the mandatory. Uh, 56 kph uh, offset default barrier uh, crash has to be mandatory. So you are saying India, uh, according to uh, the condition, independent of the vehicle condition, 50 kph should be the speed mandatory. So how do you comment urban. on this? Uh, yeah, for for urban, urban, yeah. urban yeah, so how do you, 50 or less, 50 you know, or where less. more people, more pedestrians, then go for lower speed limits. Okay. okay. So, we have understood you can't control pedestrian behavior in these situations even after right. the risk people still like to take risk but right. our aim right. is to just have finally zero deaths but right. On right. we can go at 80 or we can go at 100 on expressways but you know then we have to look at all the design issues right right and uh, there was a very interesting comment which came in the research needs to be uh, more focused to be man machine and interface and use the mind to evolve infrastructure interface to evolve designs and enhance the safety. So, and also connection with this question, there was one question that there, there was, it was from the, I think, uh, one of the road users. He says that uh, the, all the roads are very well built, yeah, without portals, uh, very well controlled by the toll booths and other things, uh, and uh, very clean, but it lacks scientific uh, method of design of roads. That means uh, the scientific knowledge is not implemented in designing of such roads. Uh, in such a way that uh, the, the, the question revolves in one example that there are concrete barriers which has been placed in, in the roads when there is a loss of control of an accident and the vehicle goes and gets to the point contact. It initiates a rollover and then the vehicle is more prone to the injury and also the severity of the accident is going to be some more. Yeah. Uh, is there any thought process in order to bring in a scientific knowledge and scientific thought process in the design of roads, uh, specifically for India. There are very clear guidelines on that. If you look at all ministry documents also uh, for uh, uh, guidelines for two lane, four lane and six lane highways, uh, barriers have to be designed scientifically. The guidelines do adhere to that. 
the problem is that on when we start implementing it uh, i also don't understand why we are not able to implement those guidelines because uh, in all our audits we have found that the median design the central verge design on highways and the crash barrier design almost 100% is wrong it is not <laughs> following the guideline which already exists so mm -hmm. also something very strange that you know all the <coughs> It's very specific how it has to be uh, installed in the ground, what should be the height, what should be the strength, uh, when we, you should use concrete, when you should use a double beam, when you should use thry beam. All these guidelines already exist. I think okay. we really have to question that what kind of institutions we have that we are not able to implement those guidelines. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I, that's related to the guidelines. And do you think that the guidelines, whatever existing uh, from the IRC, uh, is good enough for the existing vehicles and also the driving behavior, or do we need to update this? As Motor Vehicle Amendment Act was done in 1989, and it was updated only after the three, I think, four decades. <laughs> yeah. No, IRC, many IRC guidelines are being updated, but again, the process is slow. It is uh, not just slow, it is consensus based process. Uh, what many other countries do that, you know, you have your own institutions where you continuously collect your own data, uh, evaluate it, analyze it, and then modify your guidelines based on that. We are not following that process. The process in Indian Roads Congress also we are following is that, you know, simply collect literature, studies done everywhere else, and based on that, adapt it for India which is, uh, I would not say that it's a very scientific process. It's a more consensus-based process. It's based on practice, what practicing engineers feel comfortable in doing that. So I think eventually we have to move away from this process and there has to be institution which is continuously monitoring and uh, modifying guidelines based on hard evidence. Okay. So there is a very funny uh, comment from one of our uh, viewers. Uh, it says, earlier there were a lot of research which was done on those Shetty. And uh, the entire ministry and the government and all the researchers started talking about three years of transportation. So that was engineering, enforcement, and uh, uh, education. And now they moved to four years. And now they moved to five years. How many more years we need to add uh, in order to reduce the fatalities? I think really I don't have an answer. How many more years? Unless until we get uh, a dip in the reduction. Uh, but you know, this is a very outdated concept. I think three years or five years, nobody is discussing. <laughs> when we have a approach, when we are looking at zero vision documents, it has nothing. You, you don't talk about ease. You yes. talk about many other differing factors, how different subsystems are interacting with each other and where the systemic failure can occur. So it's not about ease anymore. This is mm -hmm. 1960s concept. It for many years now. Yeah, and there, there was one one uh, uh, specific point to professor uh, that as you you told about IRC and other guidelines. Guidelines are not implemented because of politics plays a major role in infrastructure construction and contracting. And guidelines of most of the contractors do not follow the common for practice, uh, and uh, there is no evidence for it. Uh, this is one of the users is giving a comment. I am not sure whether it is correct or wrong. Uh, what he comments is that uh, the guidance is not followed because of the bureaucracy in the system. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, we should uh, look at carefully, we can, we can look at the contract document. In one of the projects, we had understood that, yes, there is a penalty if you don't follow the guidelines strictly. However, for safety, uh, non-compliance, uh, the penalty is so small because most of the payment is based on the amount of work executed. So contractors don't really pay much attention to non-compliance factor. Okay. And perhaps there are many more other factors which we have to look into why we are not able to follow scientific guidelines. Okay. But uh, I think instead of just guessing, we should probably um, do a careful study and understand this is an important aspect. Okay, so there is another question from a professor from Ethiopia, from East Africa. So very interesting question. Uh, according to transport industry, the accidents in India have been reduced by 10% after implementing new metro vehicle uh, I'm not sure which uh, reduction in accidents is talking about because we did not see any reduction in number of accidents. Uh, 
but Assam and Kerala have shown increase in number of accidents approximately 7% and 5% respectively. Uh, does improving fines can simply lead to reduction of accidents? What about the other road safety issues? What about the policy makers just focusing only on uh, the fine and safety issues? Is human error also inevitable? And adherence to the system and design ensure appropriate speed conditions uh, to be enabled and things like that. So it's, it's a very evident question. Uh, probably, uh, uh, I'm not sure, the road accident has not reduced in India since a decade. That's what we were debating from morning. And uh, and also to answer the question, uh, uh, the policy makers and the Motor Vehicle Act is not only on collecting fines. There are around another, it, it is a 64 uh, article document and one of the chapter is the collection of fines. And people don't miss all the other chapters and only read about the number of fines there. So kindly just go through this and you will be able to understand what are the other Motor Vehicle Act and amendments which is being implemented in India. So uh, I think there are few more questions which is just populating uh, uh, for in the quantity of time. Uh, we will just uh, keep this uh, question answers live in the social media platform and IRC can take up. So uh, with the concluding remarks, thank you very much for Professor and also Dr. Rajesh uh, for their valuable time. So I would like to uh, uh, ask you one final thing uh, for India in order to reduce the fatalities. Uh, number one, uh, we have signed up for 30 by 50. That means we are going to reduce the tariffs by 50 percent by 2030. Is it possible? Is it is it an uh, is it an acceptable challenge which is already accepted? If yes, what are the three main things that we have to do? You can answer in terms of multi-sectoral or uh, your own thoughts process. What is that we have to do? The main three things take away in one minor uh, so that we can have a good conclusion. On. Okay, maybe I will go first and then you can hear the government point of view. <laughs> so, I think it is possible. We can achieve 50% target, provided we have a very concerted scientific e efforts. What are the three main things we can do? Look at very carefully how we can actually implement helmet law in urban as well as rural areas. We didn't discuss it uh, enough in detail, but in rural areas, it's becoming a huge issue where non-compliance is much difficult to uh, control also. So we have to find scientific uh, ways of doing it and a lot of effort is required. Second very important thing is that, uh, you know, vehicle people have already done a lot of work. Uh, pedestrian safety compliance is also going to be uh, in instituted very uh, soon, but one of the most important things now we can do is speed management by design. And this is a multi-stakeholder system has to be invoked. Speed management, that is appropriate speed, encourage people to have appropriate speed by doing correct road design. It needs a lot of new knowledge production because we do not know how to control speeds of two wheelers. We do not know how to design roundabouts which are effective uh, for two wheelers. So a lot of groundwork is required, but if we are able to do this, helmets and speed control by design, I think it is possible to achieve because vehicle technology is already being instituted in most vehicles now, like any other modern vehicle. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Dr. Rajesh, you have come from here. I would say that uh... A local multi-stakeholder action is the key for immediate. No, no. My question is 2050 by 2030. Is it is it an acceptable challenge? We already we already <laughs> kept the target. So our endeavor should be to you know not to leave any stone unturned to reach there. But then how to reach that fast? That's what I'm. So the, the answer to... is yes. It is accepted. It is achievable. Yes. yes. So. Uh, I would say immediately we have to involved with local level multi stakeholder action, which can address many things. Secondly, about uh, uh, improving governance. Governance in road safety, uh, uh, is road safety engagements or even institutions is not very uh, high. That's why we are facing problems in in you know, running the institutions or uh, realizing the target. So we have to push for governance. To that extent, maybe a lot of credible civil society agencies or uh, in education institutions can come up with the indices like 
we can we can grade institutions like uh, professor mentioned about the performance of um, uh, state level authorities so if we can uh, calibrate the performance governments certain indices and then categorize the uh, institutions then they will they will have to come out with a great level of performance based on evidence so that is one way and maybe the application of uh, new engineering technologies and maybe even smart mobility is then a, uh, really uh, i think contributed to cost Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there any points from your side? Okay, so uh, I think uh, I think with this, I think we can we can uh, close the session. So one final comment from my side that I will also take up uh, as a panelist uh, to understand that 2030 is an acceptable challenge, provided we have multi-sectoral approach that. Uh, all the agencies, uh, including uh, NGOs, governments, corporates, uh, uh, educational institutions, uh, and also uh, the uh, student community, professors' community, the, the academics, uh, and also the policy makers, the governments, all have to come onto the same platform and uh, think about the selflessness projects in this fashion, and also think of one particular common cause of reducing road fatality. Which involves various aspects, and everyone is having various uh, kind of expertise in their own verticals. Uh, so each expertise has to be done on one common platform. And I also feel that as of now, we do not have one network to build all these people on one platform to have a concentrated effort. So as we as we generally say, when the efforts are concentrated, results are definitely achievable. Uh, I think in the next decade, we have another 10 years go ahead in our uh, future. With this, I think uh, possibly we will have. Uh, uh, we will have a great uh, insight coming up. Uh, so with this, I would like to close the topic, uh, and uh, all the audience can just drop in the uh, uh, questions in the social media platform, and uh, we will be able to answer. And uh, thank you very much, Professor Deepak. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajesh. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just before we conclude, actually, uh, Deepak Das sir has also joined us. Uh, so Giri sir, I think uh, he can have his remarks as well. <laughs> he got busy. Ah. Uh, yeah. Uh, high defect, uh, always visit a gives. High defect, Saldi. Sir, his audio is not connected yet. I think he's connecting right now. Okay, okay. So we are time up already. So can we just quickly finish off another couple of minutes? Yeah. Hello? Deepak? I think he's facing um, connectivity issues. I think so. Okay. Uh, yeah, I uh, think uh, I think Anindya, then you can conclude. And in case so, uh, Amar, what we will do is we'll conclude and we'll have another session with Deepak alone uh, on the media per se for road safety. That will be a good thing to connect all the ways. Yeah? Because it's already okay. time up and people have to leave right now. So uh, yeah, yeah. thank you very much, all the people, and thank you, IRC, for giving me this opportunity. And the floor is to uh, Indian Road Safety Campaign and all of you. Thank you. So thank you uh, to all the speakers. I think uh, the session was useful. You know, we had some great questions, and in the lieu of time, we cannot take up the session right now. I mean, this is something we have been able to start that. So kindly, all of you, uh, we can the feedback form, and we can be uh, up later on and uh, provide you the response. So I'd like to all the speakers and all the attendees have given us their valuable input as well. So at the end, I'll just um, I'll let Amar sir uh, say uh, a concluding note, and um, to go to the next. Uh, yeah, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the esteemed speakers, Rajesh sir, specifically taking out time during the uh, uh, the work that you're doing as part of COVID task force. Really thankful for your uh, sort of uh, encouragement that you always provide to us. And similarly for uh, 
professor gisam tiwari yeah i think uh, she has been sort of mentoring us since the past four to five years and we are very thankful for her and uh, uh, giri sir has been sort of uh, taking care of these sessions uh, and uh, they have he has been sort of helping us uh, strategize what we can do and how so i think uh, Uh, our main agenda is we can add value during these times as well uh, the work of road safety should not stop uh, because everyone every day if we work then only we can achieve the target so uh, we'll uh, shortly circulate the feedback form and let's uh, like please keep tuned for the next webinar that will happen uh, next sunday at the same time thank you thank you everyone for joining thank you so much uh, stay safe have a nice evening thank you all stay safe uh, stay at home bye Thank you.